I always go back to the the creation of the the FHA where they bought out people's mortgages, you know, in the when when banks were failing and people's more people couldn't pay their mortgages and they extended the duration of those mortgages and allowed, you know, a million people to stay in their homes. I would call that a good in the short term. And and could they know that that would lead to the 20 and 30 year mortgage market, which would lead to the securitization of mortgages, which would lead to the housing bubble, which would lead to the government having to put all of that private debt on their balance sheet, which would lead to what well, where we are today. You know, I mean, I don't know. I, I guess I, I, I've always come back to the same thing, which is whether you ascribe intentionality to it, good motives, bad motives, I just see this as just inevitable either way. Everything that's happening is just inevitable. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the What Is Money Show. I am thrilled to have you here joining me on my mission to help shine light on the corruption of money. Now, if this is your first time listening to the What Is Money Show, I strongly recommend that you go back to episodes one through nine first, which lays a lot of the groundwork for many of the concepts that we explore on the show. These first nine episodes are my series with Michael Saylor, and thousands of people have told me that this is the best podcast series they've ever heard, hands down, and that it was instrumental to their understanding of money and Bitcoin. So if you're looking to start uh, a deep dive into the nature of money, I don't think there's any place better that you can start other than episode one of this show. Now, a little bit about this show and how it makes money. The What Is Money show is 100% sponsor based. So all of our revenues are derived from direct sponsorships. And I strive to be very selective about the sponsors that I work with, specifically only using sponsors that I use personally, and also choosing sponsors that have values which are well aligned to the values expressed on this show, such as freedom, education, self-sovereignty, etc. So what I'm going to do now is a few ad reads right at the top of the show, and then I'll do a few more ad reads in the middle. And I hope you'll take the time to listen to them, as again, these are hand-selected sponsors, and I think you'll like what they have to offer. Today's podcast is brought to you by In Wolf's Clothing. Wolf is the first startup accelerator dedicated exclusively to the Bitcoin Lightning Network. Four times per year, Wolf brings teams from around the world to New York City to work with like-minded entrepreneurs, pushing the boundaries of what's possible with Bitcoin and Lightning. The program is designed to help early-stage companies achieve product market fit, develop their brand, secure early-stage funding, and grow businesses that help fuel the global adoption of Bitcoin. So go to wolfnyc.com to learn more about the program or apply. Again, that's WolfNYC, W-O-L-F-N-Y-C dot com. Mr. Lester, welcome back to the What Is Money show. Hey, man. Um, there's a lot that's happening right now. The force of Bitcoin's move over the last few days. And we're recording on October 25th. Yeah, so starting back to the 18th, I just somehow I felt like I feel unprepared for it. I, a few episodes A few episodes ago, I said, I wasn't really prepared for the way it would actually feel when the deflationary impulse hit. I knew it was coming, but I was always looking past it to the inflationary impulse. And I was not, I remember saying, I didn't, I didn't really think through how it would feel. And I'm feeling that same thing, but in the opposite way, I, I'm a little bit taken off guard by what Bitcoin's doing. I don't really understand it. I don't think it can all be attributed to BlackRock's ticker symbol showing up on the DTCC website. Apparently, if it's if it's been there since August, I just, you know, no one knows. Tour de Mistra had a great quote. He's like, no one, no one really knows right. what the structure of Bitcoin's price is based on. It's like whatever narrative you want to assign to it, it's just as good as any other. But it's I wasn't prepared for the way it would like just distract me, you know? It's distracting. Yeah, when it moves, it really moves. I'm showing up 32% in a month. Mm -hmm. 23% of that has been in the last week. And um, 
Yeah, it's just the when this beast awakens, right? It it moves like no other up and you know down. what you know what Bitcoin is like. So in in my bio, in my Twitter bio, it says that uh my proudest proudest accomplishment is that I beat Dark Souls 3. And yes, I'm aware it's not the hardest of the Dark Souls games. <laughs> um but the thing that's amazing about the game Dark Souls is that every level there's a boss at every level and nothing no skills you acquire and no magical items you acquire make you any more prepared to face the next boss nothing you learn like is valuable for the next mm. level of the game mm -hmm. and i almost feel like bitcoin's that way like okay i learned a bunch of lessons in 2017 the, that that cycle i learned a bunch of lessons in 2021 and now i feel like maybe none of that applies to this cycle it's a whole new learning experience. Yeah, the only predictable thing about Bitcoin is its unpredictability. Mm -hmm. I guess Bitcoin's kind of like life in that way. It's just we do we learn as best we can, but life always seems to throw us curveballs. So I hope that this episode, people can, you know, no matter what's happening, this is, there's going to be. I don't know if, if when this comes out in a couple of days, I don't know if Bitcoin will have teleported to 100,000. I don't know if it will have pulled back to 25. I don't know. But you do have to remember that um, none of this changes the long view. None of this changes the fundamentals. And hopefully you can hear this episode and like shut everything out and be reminded of why we have the conviction we have and um i mean to the listener i'd say robert and i are we're bringing this story to a close it's going to be one or two more episodes or, or recording sessions and we're going to put all of this in perspective and it should be enormously heartening to know that i think what we always thought would happen is happening um and if anyways i just it's it's a it's a tonic for me personally to be able to get back to the story so uh, with that said i think we should dive in um is there anything else you want to say before we start no uh, um just again using the history of gold as a prism through which to perceive what could happen with bitcoin in a lot of different ways so uh the feedback on this series has been tremendous it's kind of like I'd call it the cult classic series of all the series we've done. And I think it's added a lot of value for people up to this point. I'm excited to uh, to see where we go next. The framework for this, the final chapters has been myths and realities. And um, I want to attack again, the idea of we're going to move on to the last, the last uh, couple myths that surround the gold standard in that one was that, you know, that, the boom of the 1920s was un, was un, was unrestrained capitalism run amok. We will tackle that and dispel that myth. And then the other was that gold sort of tied our hands. But before we do, I want to, I'd like to title this last, this, whatever this last push of episodes is, is sort of a mini series within the final series. And I'm looking at it as the dollar quagmire. And I have two quotes that I want to open this with. One is very short and one is very long. And they both tell the exact same story. And I want, it's easy to apply the first one to Bitcoin because it's about Bitcoin. The second one I want is you're hearing it, apply it to Bitcoin and, and, and the Fed and Jay Powell and our current monetary system. But these are two quotes that tell to me the same story. The first is a quote from Caroline Ellison's uh, testimony at the FTX trial. And um, the lawyer, asked her why given all that you know did you proceed to use customer money to repay alameda's lenders answer because i mean sam told me to and because i thought that if alameda just defaulted on its loans and went bankrupt right away that would be really bad and if we use customer money at least there was some chance that we'd be able to fix things somehow that maybe sam would be able to raise money and repay our loans just for context she's that's the girlfriend of sam bankman freed who was also his she was in the executive team of ftx is that right 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so she's explaining why they just use customer money because most customer money was there and it bought them another day or another hour. Mm -hmm. But it's not like she didn't know what was happening. She did it eyes open, knowing the, the, the mistake that she was making. Okay. This is the second quote. Sit back. This is a long one. This is from a memoir by Daniel Ellsberg called Secrets. And uh, it's, all, it's all about his involvement in the Vietnam War and his decision to, it leads up to and includes the story of his leaking of the Pentagon Papers. If you grew up hearing about the Pentagon Papers, it seems like an abstract, like, oh, that was a New York Times thing where someone leaked some top secret info. Um, I think if you want to get a view of what U.S imperialism is capable of going all the way back to eisenhower you should read this book but in case you don't have the time i'm going to share a long passage with you because it's relevant to what we're talking about today and where we are in the economic cycle the pentagon papers was um is like a, a top secret study that secretary of defense robert mcnamara ordered because he saw the vietnam mistake unfolding. And so the study was actually supposed to be this history of the mistakes that got the U.S. into Vietnam. Um, and it was supposed to be this like top secret reference material that decision makers could use to hopefully avoid those mistakes, but it was not supposed to be for public consumption. Um, and Daniel Ellsberg, whose quote I'm about to read you, he was actually one of the authors of the paper. He was one of the people asked to explain what went wrong for government so they would have it for reference. Uh, and then eventually he leaked the papers to the New York Times and other papers uh, to try and get us out of the war. But think about this passage in relation to the years, I mean, a hundred years of mistaken monetary policy and escalation and how the leaders at the top engage with their staff and the public and how they use all the data at their disposal to understand what's actually true, but then how they lie about what they understand and do the wrong thing anyways. Okay, this is Ellsberg. By mid-1967, for most of a decade, I had been primarily engaged in my own mind in learning about government decision-making in hopes of helping the president and the rest of government make better, less dangerous or misguided decisions in situations of conflict and uncertainty. Vietnam was a preeminent example of the urgent need for improvement. What I saw as the major lesson of Vietnam was the internal practices of lying to superiors, tacitly encouraged by those superiors, but resulting in a cognitive failure at the presidential level to recognize realities and the result of all this in the form of policy failures. This was part of a broader cognitive failure of the bureaucracy I had come to suspect. There were situations in Vietnam was an example in which the US government starting ignorant did not and would not learn. There was in Vietnam a whole set of what amounted to institutional anti-learning mechanisms working to preserve and guarantee unadaptive and unsuccessful behavior. There was the fast turnover in personnel, and the lack of institutional memory at any level. Rack Keen, who was a battalion commander from an earlier chapter of the book, Rack Keen was a perfect example, a battalion commander with no infantry experience who had scarcely met his company commanders when they went into combat together. An operation eight months later that took place in the same rice paddies whose commander wasn't even aware if American troops had ever visited them before. As Tran Nok Chow said to me in 1968, you Americans feel you have been fighting this war for seven years. You have not. You have been fighting it for one year, seven times. There was a general failure to study history or to analyze or even record operational experience, especially mistakes, and above all, effective pressures for optimistically false reporting at every level for describing progress rather than problems or failure concealed the very need for change in approach or for learning. And when I returned to Washington in the summer of 1967, I found that McNamara had launched a historical study of Vietnam decision-making. The McNamara study had been launched with a series of questions to which the secretary wanted answers. 
I was told I could choose any subject or period that I wanted to work on. To minimize my own effort, I could very naturally have chosen 1964-65, the period during which I had worked in Washington, where I had witnessed the decision-making mistakes firsthand that was under Johnson. Instead, I chose the Kennedy decision-making of 1961, a period of which I knew little, and I wanted to know more. As I've described earlier, my first visit to Saigon had been in the fall of 1961. What we'd heard then about the regime of President Ngo Dinh Diem seemed extremely unpromising as a basis for greatly increased U.S. involvement. I was glad at that time to see President Kenny Kennedy had shortly thereafter rejected proposals I had heard in Saigon to send American combat units. What surprised me, however, were the official reasons given for his choices. Kennedy said he was following closely the recommendations of Walt Rostow and Maxwell Taylor, two of his top advisors, who he had sent to Saigon personally to assess the situation, and in particular, to judge the necessity of sending U.S. ground forces. Upon returning from the trip, General Taylor and his team had reportedly concluded that South Vietnam's military resources, with the addition of marginal American supplements, were adequate to deal with the insurgency. Quote, I have great confidence in the military capability of South Vietnam to, quote, to cope with anything within its border, Taylor said, and, quote, to defend the country against conventional attack, end quote. On his return, the New York Times reported officials said that it was correct to infer that General Taylor did not look favorably up on sending U United States combat troops at this time. While opposing the sending of American combat forces, General Taylor is understood to favor the dispatch of necessary military technicians. From all that I'd heard in Saigon on my first visit, that was malarkey. I could understand it as a public rationale for not sending troops, but could the president really allow the public to be reassured like that about the situation he was getting deeper into if he'd heard anything like what I had heard? His team had to have heard the same briefings, read the same reports. <clears throat> How could they have concluded? How could they have told the president that advisors alone with helicopters and specialists would turn that situation around? From my own firsthand experience as a consultant in the Pentagon, it was easy for me to suppose that for some bureaucratic reasons, the president's representatives, representatives had been misled. Or if not lied to, they must at least have heard from people very different opinions from the ones I had talked to. I, too, thought we shouldn't send troops, but not out of optimism, just the opposite. One clear lesson I drew from my experience was that military advisors and support units alone, exactly what Kennedy was sending, would definitely not be adequate. And by the way, this is me. When I start saying things like, from this passage, sending advisors, <laughs> you should be thinking raising rates or QE. So I'll read that sentence again. One clear lesson I drew from my experience was that military advisors and support units alone, just what Kennedy was sending, would definitely not be adequate. Why would the same majors and colonels who had just spoken so candidly to me have told an entirely different story to Maxwell Taylor? Could they have fooled the president that badly? The hypothesis I brought in the fall of 1967 to the data on 1961 was a familiar one from accounts of the whole period up till then, including those by David Halberstam and Arthur M. Schlesinger Jr. This was essentially the quagmire model, that optimistic operational reporting, plus ill-founded assurances from advisors in Washington, especially military ones, had confirmed for President Kennedy, mistakenly, the adequacy of the course he chose. Referring initially to the 1961 decision to send advisors, Schlesinger wrote, this was the policy of one more step. Each new round of QE, I mean, each new step always promising the success which the previous last step had also promised, but had unaccountably failed to deliver. Extending this to subsequent years, Schlesinger asserted, each step in the deepening of the American commitment was reasonably regarded at the time as the last that would be necessary. Yet in retrospect, each step led only to the next until we find ourselves entrapped today in the nightmare of American strategists, a land war in Asia, a war which no president, including President Johnson, desired or intended. Before I had read these documents, this sounded plausible. It was the point of view with which I began my work on the McNamara Study Project, or as it eventually became known, the Pentagon Papers. 
from my own field experience, it was not hard to suppose that President Johnson, whose final decisions I had only seen on TV, though I worked for him, that he was being misled by wildly misleading rose-colored reports of progress that I knew were being fed upward to Walt Rostow and Bob Comer's White House offices. The effect of this inference was to greatly reduce, in my mind, the burden of responsibility or blame for an inadequate and failing policy attributed to each of the presidents and to place it on their advisors, particularly those in the military, and on their defective perceptions and reporting a systemic cognitive failure. The solution seemed to be to find ways to get better information to the president. I knew from journalistic accounts that reassuring operational reporting and optimistic military proposals of the sort I myself had witnessed personally in 1966-67 had likewise been characteristic of 62-63 and of late 1950s and of even earlier in the French command in the period just before Dien Bien Phu. None of these happened to be the years in which major decisions to escalate were taken. But like many other analysts, I assume this pattern of optimistic deception and self-deception flowing upward to be true, as well in our critical years of commitment. These would include Truman's decision to support the French directly in 1950, Eisenhower's commitment to DM in 1954, Kennedy's decision to break through the Geneva ceiling on U.S. advisors in 1961. But within a month of working on the files in the McNamara study offices, I discovered that this assumption was mistaken. Every one of these crucial decisions was secretly associated with realistic internal pessimism, deliberately concealed from the public. I began by sifting through the Pentagon documents and the national intelligence estimates relating to Indochina, which I requested and received from the CIA, the years 1950 to 1960, before moving on to 1961. It was evident in each one of the years of a major decision was that the president's choice was not founded upon optimistic reporting or assurances of the success of his chosen course. Contrary to nearly all public accounts, neither of these elements was present for Truman in 1950, Eisenhower in 1954-55, nor were they present for Kennedy in 1961. The choices for escalation were always preceded by gloomy realism, including an internal consensus that the new commitment the president was choosing would probably fail. In this light, the actual pattern of escalation seemed all the more mysterious. I chose to look at 1961 because I always, I'd always been puzzled about Kennedy's choice in Vietnam that fall. What was he led to believe? What was his understanding of what he was starting? I was looking for an explanation of the apparent contradiction between what I had heard and seen in September of 1961 and what the president's advisors, according to the press accounts and official statements, had concluded in October. Supposedly that the measures Kennedy approved in November would be adequate. That contradiction dissolved as soon as I held in my hand Taylor's actual personal recommendation to the president and the judgment on which he based them. The press accounts of the time had simply been wrong. The official statements were lies. Maxwell Taylor had not advised the president that the program he ended up approving would be adequate, even in the short run. Also, Taylor had not recommended against combat troops, just the opposite. In a top secret cable, eyes only for the president, he not only recommended the introduction of a U.S. military and fourth in force in South Vietnam without delay, but also said that he had reached the conclusion that this is an essential action if we are to reverse the present downward trend of events. In fact, I do not believe that our program to save South Vietnam will succeed without it. He was recommending an initial force of six to 8,000 troops, but with a clear recognition that many more could follow. Although U.S. prestige is already engaged in South Vietnam, this is from Taylor's recommendation, it will become more so by the sending of troops. If the first contingent is not enough to accomplish the necessary results, it will be difficult to resist the pressure to reinforce. If the ultimate result is sought is closing of the frontiers and the cleanup of the insurgency within South Vietnam, there is no limit to our possible commitment. Nor was he alone in his recommendation of ground troops or his other judgments that they were essential to avert victory of the communists and that sending moderate forces might initially lead to ultimately engaging a very large U.S. force or even to war with China, but that without sending any combat troops, all other measures proposed, the ones that Kennedy adopted and announced, would be inadequate. Taylor and his team 
had not heard in Saigon and hadn't told the president anything different from what I'd heard weeks earlier about the prevailing situation and the prospects in Vietnam. The official statements and news stories about their judgments and recommendations and their view that advisors would be adequate had just been false. In light of this understanding, why the information had lied about these matters, well, that wasn't hard to explain if the president rejecting the nearly unanimous advice of his senior officials was going to send advisors and support units, but no more than these, it wouldn't be helpful to tell the truth about the actual judgments he'd heard on the ineffectiveness of this program or the urgent recommendations he'd received to do more. But all this did raise another puzzle. Faced with these recommendations and judgments, how in the world could Kennedy have done just what he did and not more or not less? None of the documents I found answered this challenge. Instead, they posed it acutely. At the same time, they demolished Schlesinger's quagmire explanation described earlier. What these secret documents showed was that his explanation didn't fit Kennedy's 1961 decisions any better than Johnson's in 65 or Truman and Eisenhower escalations earlier. Whatever it was that each president thought privately he might achieve from what he decided to do, it could not simply be the product of bureaucratic euphoria or deception. Indeed, each of those crisis years, there had been realistic intelligence analysis and operational reporting available to the president. Thus, the problem remained of explaining how and why the president had arrived at the choices he made. If each president had been told at the point of escalation that what he was choosing to do would probably not solve the problem, then what was he up to? Why not do more or less? Moreover, why did each one mislead the public and Congress about what he was doing in Indochina and what he had been told? Kennedy's decision to send advisors and not combat units did indeed look like a relatively small step compared with Johnson's later escalations. But as I learned from the documents, no one had promised its success, nor was it reasonably regarded at the time by anyone at all inside the government as the last step that would be necessary. The same was true under Johnson. For Kennedy, as for Johnson, in fact, it was the president who was deceiving the public, deceiving the public, and not his subordinates who were deceiving him. So I have some conclusions to draw about all that. But before I get into my takeaway, do you, do you have any thoughts? Well, the first quote about um, FTX using customer funds to stave off their own bankruptcy that just jumped out at me like central banking in a way right it's um you know an organization goes into an economic crisis and they use whatever means are available to them to keep the shell game going basically mm -hmm. and so it just reiterates the mantra in bitcoin don't trust verify like once you trust humans right to custody uh, to have agency over you in some way, in this case, custodying your wealth, like it's almost certainly going to be that trust is going to be broken in a time of crisis. And um, yeah, I don't think there's a way around that. It's not like I, I really don't like the argument when people talk about like focusing on the people inside of these institutions, like, oh, they're idiots. We just need better people. Because when the crisis comes, it's like, people just maneuver to protect themselves right mm -hmm. so rather than tell the truth and go into insolvency ftx perpetrates a fraud right um when, when the nation state is deficit deficit spending and you know we're faced with a government shutdown we print the money you know like it's it's just one of these sort of dire aspects of human nature that people just can't resist the, resist the temptation in times of crisis to extend by any means necessary, uh, which usually involves a fraud of some sort. And then on the longer passage, I don't know what was occurring to me initially. I was thinking that it was like bad information flowing up the U.S. chain of command as a product of central planning, but it sounds like they had actually good information at times but we're just choosing to willfully deceive the public. And so I'm not sure, is that an agency problem? Is this is people just trying to cover their asses and keep their jobs, including the president. Like I, I'm not, I'm not clear on what's going on there. And then the one part of the uh, excerpt that you highlighted that there's no limit to our possible commitment. 
uh, he was saying in regards to sending you know more troops to uh, to Vietnam. Is that just an infinite sunk cost fallacy? Is just like, you know, we'll we'll do whatever it takes to keep doubling down, and rather than reassessing the the initial intention or mission itself, you'd rather just keep doubling down on it ad infinitum. And so I'm not yeah. sure what's happening there, but those are just the things that came up for me. Yeah, it's 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 um, it's complex. There's there's a journey that Elberg Ellsberg goes on and he takes us on that journey. And I want to equate it not just with Powell and Congress and our dead situation, but with every major issue of US prestige, imperialism, and like public relations, essentially, and then the human ego. So, like to recap, Ellsberg was firsthand he witnessed false reporting. The book opens basically with the with the Tonkin Gulf incident where there was this all night. They were getting um, reports from a destroyer. We're under attack. We're under attack. And then the next day after no one slept, they get a message saying, oh, uh, maybe we weren't under attack. It might have been that our sonar person was hearing our own our own propeller. And then. Johnson goes on TV and says, due to attack, we're going to step up our own attacks. But Johnson knew by that time that the attack was false and used the Tonkin Gulf incident as his own pretext to start bombing people, which is murder, knowing that this was not correct. So this is like the opening. This is this is Ellsberg witnessing like false reporting, but then Johnson making a different decision. And he assumes that this false reporting is what led to the quagmire of Vietnam, but he finds out that that didn't happen and that there was a sober assessment of the facts that was available to decision makers who knew that incremental steps had no chance of success, but they took them anyway. I think Caroline Ellison boils it down in the simplest way. We were stalling for time. We knew it was bad. If we accept a defeat, it was unconscionably bad, but we had this one way out that maybe maybe we could get saved if we just if we just hurt people some more, but saved ourselves, then maybe we would just miraculously get saved because the truth would be violent in some way. Mm. And what it takes Ellsberg, I think, a long time to say through telling the history is exactly the same. Humans stall for time hmm. and they do not want to admit defeat. And in the case of the monetary system, you know, uh, there's a passage in Twilight of Gold and I, I went searching for it. I couldn't find it. There was one central banker in the wake of the stabilization crisis post World War One who actually did tell the public, hey, we're going to deflate the currency. Uh, it's going to be a depression, but we need to peg to gold. There's like one central banker who, it might have been actually post-1929. I couldn't find the passage. Uh, he was killed by a mob. There's like one example of someone who just said, hey, we lost. Uh, it's going to suck. Uh, we're going to fix it by taking the pain now. And they dragged him out in the street and they killed him. I think that is what every that's what everyone's trying to avoid. And so they do even if it even I mean, you know, if you think about like what we did in Vietnam, like the number of people that we murdered just so that a president could just go a little bit further knowing it wouldn't work, but taking all those human lives, American and Vietnamese as like, well, that's the cost of me wanting to preserve whatever fiction of the American empire I'm trying to preserve right now. Oh, and then we lost in the end anyways. I don't, I don't think that the Vietnam thing is a metaphor or an allegory. I think it's a literal example of the exact same type of late stage imperialist overreach, the decay of the system, financial tampering, that is the playbook for people in power and government since the Roman Empire, even before they do this. 
I think the thing to remember, and, and, and this is why I'm bringing it up in, in, in this whole myths and reality section. Like a lot of people make fun of the central government and they make fun of Powell or they say, how could they be such idiots? And I would say as Bitcoiners, we have to know which myths are true and which ones are false. I would have to bet that they're not idiots. I would have to bet that they aren't just making these mistakes because they don't know any better. My guess is they know full well that what they're doing won't work. And if it seems to you to be like a riddle in your mind, well, how could they do it anyway? These two passages explain it. They just do it anyway, because to admit defeat would mean being dragged out in the street and like ripped apart. Oh, yeah, that's, well, the old saying, all right, the truth hurts. Kind of take the pain now by telling the truth, or you can take the path of least resistance, which is to lie, mm -hmm. try to defer that reconciliation to the truth, whether it's, you know, failed military campaign or failed economic policy. And then you just externalize the cost of that <laughs> reconciliation onto others, right? So there's there's a lot of self-preservation demonstrated here, just individual self-preservation. Um, and it, you know, it's a, it's just important to understand that that we a lot of people think these institutions are operating in our best interest for some reason, but like why? Why would they? Right? These institutions are operated by individuals. Mm -hmm. The individuals are in pursuit of their own self-preservation. You know, if that means telling you a lie so they don't have to incur the cost, I, I think it's pretty obvious what most people will do in that situation. And yeah, by virtue of giving a human discretion, you actually hamper the the the, the decision making process because the human who makes the decision has a vested self interest in not being dragged out into the street and killed. Exactly, and so I was drawing parallels in my mind this aversion to telling the truth it maybe sort of parallels the self-censorship we see in cancel culture today like people are scared to say the thing that they actually think yeah yeah because they don't want to get canceled only getting canceled in this case was actually getting you know murdered by a mob rather than just socially shamed online or whatever it may be and uh i don't it just seems like real we're looking at people trying to navigate the proverbial rock in a hard place. Um, and the other quote that came to mind here, I, don't, I forgot who said it, but he said, there's no good place to stand during a massacre. Mm -hmm. So like sometimes you just don't have a good decision. Um, but it's unfortunate that, the, you know, what is it, the nature of the business? Like, right, you're, you're you're in a government, you're out there stealing and killing as a means of economic livelihood. Are we surprised at all that deception and it may, perhaps even self-deception comes into this? Because I'm sure, I mean, I'm sure hopefully someone had some moral scruples, right, before they just bold-faced lie to the public. Surely some people are like, yeah, this is probably not going to be good, but then they can start rationalizing why they need to do it, you know, self-preservation, protect my family, whatever it may be. Um, but it just, I don't know, it's kind of just occurs to me that this whole business is bad. The business of statism is bad. Killing, stealing, destroying, lying, like it, it just doesn't, doesn't seem to do much good. Well, there's no we haven't like installed an oracle for truth, except for, I would say, the market seems to be the closest thing as mm -hmm. an oracle for truth that exposes the lies. Yeah. And, uh, you know, a lot of us have been waiting for like the credit event, the thing that is going to destabilize the economy and maybe bring a drawdown in assets or a drawdown in Bitcoin. And I think maybe the credit event we've been looking for is actually happening right now um i have a, a chart down later to show but like for the first time in the history of fed pauses yields have been rising ever in in in, in it, whenever the fed pauses yields start going down because people assume that okay a recession is coming and cuts are coming and so but the Fed paused last last meeting and yields have continued to rise. That's that has never happened. And the 
the problem that the Fed is facing and that we're facing is the U.S. deficit is just so large that they have to issue so many treasuries to stay afloat. And that will flood the market with a supply of treasuries that will drive the price down. Just a simple supply and demand problem. And if the Fed can't engineer a recession, um, then we'll have inflation and then long end will start continue to go down. But if they do raise rates and we have a recession, then you have government deficits. Government deficits are already historically... Well, let me get to those charts later. Let me, let me not get into this now. The point is, my point is, there is no way out. There's no move. That's why I'm saying all this. There's no... The Fed has no moves that work. And so this is what happens when they have no moves that work. This one... You don't have to answer this if we want to talk about it later, maybe. But if perhaps bonds, treasury bonds are, are being decreasingly used as a flight to safety this time, maybe that explains something about the move in Bitcoin. We've also seen a little move in gold. Um, you think that might be part of this, the, the actual confidence in um, treasury bonds as you know the ultimate safe haven asset is is crumbling 100 percent. that is 100 percent it the, the unfortunately the only people who still perceive it's so dark but the only people who still perceive bonds as a flight to safety are retail and mm. guess who's buying all of it now mm. that and hedge funds who Hedge funds don't give a fuck. And as, if the price starts to move, they'll dump it as well. Yeah. But the marginal buyer of treasuries now is hedge funds. It's not, it's not foreign governments anymore. Everyone understands that the US has essentially become an emerging market who has to finance their deficit with money creation. Everyone gets that. Who knows? And so, yeah, uh, Tavi Costa had a really, really interesting chart, which is for the first time in 40 years, the downside vol volatility of gold is less than treasuries. And that's on a that's on a seven year rolling basis. I'm not talking like a month or two, seven year rolling downside volatility. Gold is better than treasuries. If that doesn't explain psychologically what's happening to the market for treasuries, then nothing will. And, um, you know, and Bitcoin is better than gold. So, yeah, that's exactly it. The market gets it. And the last participants, you know, what, what makes me sad is that a bunch of people are like, hell, man, I'll lock in 5%. Uh, I was, you know, even talking to my sister, she's like, uh, yeah, 5%. That sounds good. It's time to lock that in. Well, if treasuries sell off further, everyone thinks, oh, this is where, you know, total returns got to turn around. Yield, ne yields are never going to be this high. Well, they probably will be this high. And if they're not this high, it's because the Fed had to step in and do yield curve control, in which case you'll get decimated by inflation. So it's like people who haven't spent all the time, all their time thinking about this, just how I can't explain it to them, but this they'll everyone will get killed by it. Yeah, you're at, we're at or near the measure of last resort, right? And we had Lynn Alden on the show, and you know, one of the conclusions we reached, the old curve control is financial repression. So government needs more funding. Um, this is one of the arrows in their quiver, right? They'll just confiscate it basically through these fancy sounding machinations. Uh, but at the end of the day, you're just scalping savers, scalping retail, as you said. Dude, I'll tell you something. People's biggest criticism of Bitcoin and Bitcoin's role in our future I was going to save this statement for the end, but I'm going to say it now. People in the know, economists, you know what their biggest criticism of Bitcoin is? That it's too predictable. <laughs> Every fundamental criticism of Bitcoin boils down to, but it's too predictable. Think about that. That's why they say it can't be the basis of value for the world or the world's currency, because it is too predictable. You know, give me a predictable asset mm -hmm. 
and some creative people, if if we can make the fiat system work through World War One, the Great Depression, the the bullion standard, the gold exchange standard, the classical gold standard, the the Bretton Woods, the petrodollar standard, the euro dollar standard, uh, QE, not QE, reverse repo, the bank term funding program. If we can, through all that creativity, make the fiat standard work for a hundred years, then Bitcoin can work for a hundred thousand years. Yeah, because is, all it takes is adaptation. That is a ridiculous statement, right? <laughs> Too predictable. Um, I mean, well, what what is gold, right? Isn't that why gold is gold, right? It's the most predictable, predictably supplied analog asset, right? Mm-hmm. It's been valued as money for 5,000 years. Like all the arguments that people throw out in favor of gold are rooted in its predictability. Yeah. And Bitcoin has perfected predictability in the money, right? It's it's the closest thing to perfect information we're ever going to have in a market. Mm -hmm. If you are a business owner or manager, you should know these three numbers, 36,000, 25, and 1. 36,000 is the number of businesses that have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, which allows you to streamline accounting, financial management, human resources, and more. NetSuite turns 25 years old this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days rather than weeks, and to drive down cost. And finally, one, because your business is one of a kind. So with NetSuite, you get a customized solution for all your key performance indicators in one efficient system with one source of truth. NetSuite is everything you need all in one place. Right now, you can download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash whatismoney. That's netsuite.com slash whatismoney to get your free KPI checklist. Again, netsuite.com slash whatismoney. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, iCoin Technology. iCoin has just released a sleek new hardware wallet. Looks like a mini iPhone, a little touch screen and camera on it. Uh, the device has no Wi-Fi, no cellular connection, no GPS. It's a strictly physically cold hardware wallet. Uh, like I said, it's got a high-res 3-inch touchscreen. It's got a camera for air gapping the wallet. Uh, it's got optional Bluetooth compatibility. And it's a really a, a brand new UI, UX experience for a hardware wallet, making it very accessible, easy to use, not intimidating. And as we always talk about on this show, the only way you can truly own your Bitcoin is by having it in self-custody. So you need a device like iCoin Wallet to truly own your Bitcoin. Go to iCoinTechnology.com today and use promo code BITCOIN23 for 30% off of this new sleek hardware wallet. In the last episode, we talked about how credit events are brought out by or they're they're precipitated by non-monetary causes. This is just you and me riffing. And we agreed, you and I agreed that monetary inflation usually precedes a big credit event, but a non-monetary accident or calamity usually sets alight the dry tinder of credit inflation that has been building up in the system. Um, you know, as we record this, we might be on the verge of such a non-monetary event as events in the Middle East heat up. Bitcoin itself might be an event that kicks off credit inflation. You know, Bitcoin has its own gravity and Bitcoin is doing its own thing right now. So the bond market in general, not today, but in general is selling off on the realization that, you know, as you and I just talked about, the U.S. government's going to have to fund a gigantic amount of debt and that there's no longer any buyer big enough. So that's like where we are. That leads us to myth number two in our list, which was that laissez-faire capitalism was to blame for the Great Depression. So this is, uh, I'm going to read a lot from Rothbart's book, uh, um, Rothbart, uh, America's Great Depression. He writes, the chief impact of the Great Depression on American thought was universal acceptance of the view that laissez-faire capitalism was to blame. The common opinion among economists and the lay public alike holds that unrestructed capitalism prevailed in the 1920s. And that the tragic depression shows that old-fashioned laissez-faire can work no longer. Uh, 
the argument that this myth embodies assumes that this boom and bust cycle is endogenous to how free capital free market capitalism works and that so like left to its own devices unhampered you get prosperity and depression and it just comes back and forth and austrian business cycle theory says that's not the case so just as i've done 10 or 15 times go back and read chapter one of america's great depression it's like the most eye-opening chapter of any econ book even including twilight of gold i would just say that one chapter and uh you know i outlined austrian business cycle theory in a couple previous episodes where we talked about interest rates so i don't want to recap it again here but it's 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 about the different rates at which the prices of consumer goods rise versus the price of producers goods during a credit expansion so during a credit expansion businesses who make use of much more credit and on a larger scale than consumers businesses go on borrowing binges and bid up the factors of production faster and the factors of production rise in price faster than it's all about relative faster than the price of consumer goods so one company they might like borrow a bunch of money to build a factory only to find that like the other factories don't exist which are necessary to make a finished product um so like you know you might raise a bunch of money to start an electric car company only find that there's not enough lithium mines to make the batteries so the battery price rise beyond what consumers are willing to pay your company fails everyone's out of work so that like accounts for the business cycle also if a bank or government steps in and gives you a huge loan to keep producing allowing you to pay higher price for lithium than what you once thought you could then a bunch of money goes into lithium production at even higher in prices but it 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 at the end it it doesn't matter your costs are materials labor and borrowing costs so if borrowing costs go down then you can still eke out a profit so long as you don't rise materials and labor too much so it also explains why um in a, in a credit expansion um people's earning power cannot keep up with with inflation because businesses would start going out of business and as soon as businesses start going out of business the government intervenes with lower rates and more credit expansion so that they can lower the borrowing costs but keep everything else the same but producers prices keep going up so um anyways i i had more stuff i'm i'm, I'm doing what i said i wasn't gonna do which is recap austria business cycle theory but you see you get it so the question is is was the 1920s a period of unrestrained capitalism now you have to understand the american economy in the 1920s the economy was there's two very different conflicting forces shaping the economy in the 1920s on the one hand america had a genuine prosperity lots of savings lots of investment lots of highly productive capital and american living standards went way up so that is good most people call that good on the other hand there is a massive credit expansion with a massive malinvestment of capital leading finally to the crisis most people call this bad so there's these two forces are interplaying and the interplay between these two forces that's what gives us the final historical result so every all the prices you see all the indices the, the production numbers the stock market they're a composite effect of these two competing forces and again everything i'm saying is totally paraphrasing from rothbard so if you read this you'll get everything i'm saying but even better but the march of technology in the 20s and all the new prosperity actually camouflaged any rise in prices that you might see like along the lines of like the lithium plant example I was talking about like over borrowing was driving up commodity prices but techniques of mass production improved so much that prices actually came down despite them being driven up they just here's the thing they just didn't come down enough and that's the key so if the cost of bread decreases by 10 percent but bread output increased by 50 percent there's two times as much bread but you're only getting a tiny 10 percent discount so technically there has been an inflation in the price of bread but no one's going to know about it no one's going to complain because it's invisible and that's what happened in the 1920s no just the, the yeah the i guess this is always happening right there's always these titanic forces of expanding human production and economies and productivity right pushing prices down 
trying to deliver goods and services better, faster, cheaper. But then you also have these uh, anti-market or anti-capitalistic interventions that are distorting those markets. And so when mm-hmm. you, I guess the dislocations get bad enough, right? If the productivity wasn't expanded enough, then you get uh, businesses start to fail, right? For whatever whatever dislocation takes them out. And that as that spreads, right, the business failures and that becomes widespread, that's your recession. And, so, then, and, and, and then, then you start to see prices actually rise because, you know, the, we've, we've, we've squeezed all the productivity we can get for the time yeah. being. So then finally, prices have to catch up with the exactly. expansion that's been pumped out into the economy. Yeah. And then so total output collapses, but the money supply is typically it's increased. Just, so yeah. prices go up. So here's, you know, here's what the 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 20s was in fact a a a dizzying storm of productivity and that's what created the inflation um just some examples um our net increase in the production of electricity 1912 25 billion kilowatt hours 1929 117 billion kilowatt hours went from 25 to 117 um, uh, index of physical productions. If you if you set 1909 to 1913, the end of the classical gold standard, if you set that as your value of 100, production reached 163.5 in 29. Um, that's total physical production. Manufacturing, just manufactured goods index, went to 192.9, which is so they almost doubled physical production in manufactured goods. It's exactly Austrian business cycle, by the way. Those two numbers show are an illustration of ABCT, which is manufactured goods one ninety uh, doubled, but total production doubled by. Well, no, those don't scratch what I'm saying. They're both production. Um, okay, money supply increased sixty one point eight percent. Goods engineering the economy rose one hundred percent. So all these new goods. And services absorbed all of the new money creation, and so it op. You know, you have even if you're creating new money, you you know the money, as we said in the very first first couple minutes of the first episode, money is just a reflection of the economy it serves. So if you're adding new goods and services to the economy, if the money stays the same, then the prices have to go down because there's a finite amount of money. But if you're if the money supply is increasing, but there are more goods and goods and services are entering faster than prices are still going to go down. So that offset the inflation. And this is why I've been saying since the beginning that the, the price stability mandate is actually just camouflage for money printing. So in 1920s, we said the birth of the radio industry, that was 1922. Refrigerators replaced ice boxes where you, like you could just plug something in instead of someone having to like travel around and give you ice to store. Gas stoves replaced coal as a source of heating for houses you had public utilities making electricity the auto industry ford produced 435,898 cars in 1918 435,898 in 1923 so just at the very beginning of the boom they were producing 1,831 cars i mean talk about new goods and services entering the economy in terms of uh... asset Sorry, this is to restate that 435,000 cars in 1918 to 1.8 million in 1923. So a 4X in five years. Yeah. You can print a lot of money and not, you know, prices still have to go down to absorb all those new things people want to buy. Um, And then, of course, we know asset inflation is just inflation. It's just garden variety vanilla inflation. Asset inflation needs to be included when you think about inflation. Um, Ford capitalized his company in 1903 for 100K, $100,000. Uh, in 1923, he got an offer to be acquired for a billion dollars. Uh, Ford turned that down. So if you if you had $100 in Ford shares, that became a million dollars in 20 years, 13 doublings. Um, Keep in mind, again, 
All of this output allows for reduced costs in the goods and higher wages to people without raising prices of the goods. So this also ties in the Jeff Booth thesis that deflation through technology effectively hides the increase in the money supply. Uh, copper output doubled from 1920 to 29, but the price declined only 25.8%. You see the pattern? 2x the now amount of copper, but right. a 25% cost reduction. That is inflation in the price. Yeah, the, the way I like to frame that is, you know, inflation is basically harvesting whatever economic surplus or additional productivity that's being created. So in your copper example, if output doubled and demand was constant, price should have declined by 50%. Mm -hmm. But instead it declines half of that because it has to absorb all the money creation. Yeah. So there's effectively 2x inflation, 100% inflation in the price. Right. Um, I'm just going to rattle these off. Lead production rose 64%. Price declined by 22%. Sugar output increased 56%. Price down 6.4%. Between 20 and 24, over 100 million new coffee trees were planted. I don't know how that, I don't know what that number is relative to the existing, but price down 4%. Wheat excess production reached 1.2 billion bushels by the time the depression happened in 1933, which was, that was a big part of Roosevelt's concern was that he wanted to try and devalue the dollar to raise prices. Uh, but even though that we had all that excess production, wheat prices only decreased by 12%. So they should have decreased more. And but Roosevelt's like, no, we got to raise them. Tractors. In 1918, there were 85,000 tractors in use in American farms. By 29, 827,000 tractors. And if you just think about like, just like the, uh, I think the automated threshing machine, there's like, there's some really interesting figure, like for all of human history, um, a manual thresher, like a person with a scythe could harvest a half an acre from like Egypt until like the 1800s in America. And then suddenly the, um, the first automatic threshing machine, I'm hoping, I hope I'm calling the machine the right name, allowed a single person still with a horse to clear like three or four acres and then now you add tractors like food production was skyrocketing the at the addition of of almost eight hundred thousand new tractors think about what that did for the our ability to produce food and bring down the cost of food there's an excess supply of 130 tons of butter by the end of 1933 but even though there's a huge glut of butter prices were down 10 percent Cotton production was 45% greater at the end of the 20s. And synthetic rayon was introduced to compete with cotton. Cotton prices for producers only decreased 21 to 26%. They were being bid up massively. So I'm going to read Rothbard again. The designation of the 1920s as a period of inflationary boom may trouble those that think of inflation as a rise in prices. Prices generally remained stable and even fell slightly over the period, but we must realize that two great forces were at work on prices during the 1920s. The monetary inflation, which propelled prices upward, and the increase in productivity, which lowered prices and costs. In a purely free market society, increasing productivity will increase the supply of goods and lower costs and prices, spreading the fruits of a higher standard of living to all consumers. But this tendency was offset by the monetary inflation, which served to stabilize prices. Such stabilization was and is a goal desired by many, but it prevented A, the fruits of a higher standard of living from being diffused as widely as it would have been in a free market, and B, it generated the boom and depression of the business cycle. For a hallmark of the inflationary boom is that prices are higher than they would have been in a free and unhampered market. Once again, the statistics cannot discover the casual processes at work. Rothbard has a fantastic line in here, which is that, let's see if I remember it correctly, he says, theory does not emerge Phoenix-like from the cauldron of statistics, <laughs> which means you can't just look at these numbers and understand what was happening behind the scenes. Sure, prices went down. What does that mean? Does that mean we got, you know, you, you have to like dig a lot deeper to understand it. But I try and remember that. All, when I, someone 
presents a chart on Twitter that like seems to like just violate what I think to be is true. I just always think that, well, theory does not emerge Phoenix like from the cauldron of statistics. <laughs> There's a that just reminds me too of a, like a deeper point in the Austrian school that economic economics and economic history are not the same thing, right? There's economic theory, you know, you have axioms that you deduce economic theorems from, and then there's just what, what happened in markets, but you have to understand the theory in order to properly interpret the observational data. Yeah, you have. Yes, I, I agree. Cause you can look at the data and, and, and just have no clue. Well, why did sure. the price go up? You know, there's yeah. so, so many things that make a price go up or go down and, and you can fit any narrative to it you want. Right. So what's the old quote? There's lies, damn lies and statistics. <laughs> And the other quote that it reminded me of, you're the, you said, theory does not arise phoenix-like from the ashes of statistics. From, from a cauldron of statistics? Yeah. Um, I think it's Taleb, maybe. In theory, there is no difference between theory and practice. In practice, there is. So just this whole idea that, um, I don't know, people observe what things that happen in an economy, and then they just put forth an answer, an explanation. And it, that, that's not how it works, right? Um, theory theory is the interpretive mechanism for empirical data. And a lot of us, you know, the point of this is what myth do these, what, 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 in what service are these theories, the, the ones that we're trying to demolish? The, the, myth, the narrative creation. Yeah. He who controls the model controls the narrative. Your, your he who can, yeah, that's right. He who controls the model controls the narrative. That's right. People who think that capitalism run amok is a cause of the Great Depression. Well, the only answer is then, well, then we must, we have to insert a regulatory body to oversee capitalism. That's who, that's who's, that's the, 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 the regulatory bodies are the ones who benefit from that myth. And that's why I think, that's why I'm being so exhaustive in relaying this work because anyone who's listening to this, I'd like them to have and to feel they have a full mastery of why these are myths. Bitcoiners need to be armed to the teeth with knowledge of why the conventional wisdom is not true. Um, so let's get beyond this assertion that credit creation bid up producer prices and get into the mechanics of it. So that we're not just like saying that it happened. Um, both Pally and Rothbart attack this question in exactly the same way. Uh, Pally has a table uh, explaining the Federal Reserve Act of 1913 and how it changed statutory reserve requirements. So here's what Pally says about it. Moreover, the wartime inflation was greatly facilitated by the design of the new Federal Reserve System. Before 1914, the national banks in the two central reserve cities, New York and Chicago, had to carry 25% reserves in legal money, mainly gold, for demand deposits and the same for time deposits. The requirements were lower for some 50 reserve city banks and all other regional banks called country banks, which could count a major portion of their balances held with reserve city banks as part of legal requirements. There, by the way, as I'm throwing all these terms out, reserve, central reserve, country, just, we'll, we'll go over it a couple times, let it wash over you. It's There is an important designation, but this is language of the federal reserve system. So start just just let it if you, if you haven't heard it before don't stress about it um thereafter the reserve requirements of the banking system as a whole were cut in a spectacular fashion an idea of the extent of the reductions in legal reserves of national banks since 1913 can be obtained by the way i'm reading pally an idea of the extent of the reductions in legal reserves of national or banks of national banks since 1913 can be obtained by assuming Hypothetically, three national banks, each having 1.2 million demand deposits, 300,000 in time deposits, aka savings account, and 100,000 of national bank notes outstanding. One bank being a central reserve city, one bank being in a central reserve city, one in a reserve city, and one in a country bank city. And asking ourselves what the ultimate legal cash reserves would have been held against those deposits of 1.2 million, 300,000, 100,000 respectively in 1913 and 1920. The answer is given in the following table. 
So he has a table which says that now, again, the Federal Reserve System is designed to be opaque and hard to understand, but they have these different designations based on where the bank was geographically. So if you were in a central reserve city bank, then against those deposits, which were all um, different types of deposits, demand deposits can be taken at any time. Time deposits are, we don't really have these. Now we kind of call them CDs, but there were time deposits were your savings account. In order to withdraw a time deposit, you had to like go down to the bank with your passbook and you could only withdraw like once a month. Um, so 300,000 in time deposits at the 100,000 in national bank notes outstanding. In 1913, a central reserve city bank would have to have 25% of that total amount in reserve, which was 375,000. In 1920, after the Federal Reserve Act, 4.8% or 62,000 against that total amount of 1.6 million. A reserve city bank, Prior to 1913, 15.6% in reserve against that same same amount outstanding or 234,000 in 1920, 3.34 or 50,000 against 1.6 million. A country bank before 1920, 7.4% or 111,000. By 1920, 2.5%. All they needed was 37,500. And these were most of the banks that failed, these country banks. 2.5% or $37,000 in reserve against outstanding liabilities of 1.6 million after the Federal Reserve Act. If you go to page 95 of America's Great Depression and read the chapter called Generating the Inflation, the Central Reserve City Banks, they had the highest reserve requirement for demand deposits. So each type of deposit had a different requirement. They had a 13% requirement against demand deposits versus 10 for reserve city banks and seven for country banks. And in the 1920s, there was a shift away from country banks to urban banks. As people moved to the city, they brought their deposits to the city. So actually, reserve requirements on most deposits went up because uh, country banks, let me make sure I, you, you still, I'm still here, right? My computer made noises. Yep, I can hear you. Um, actually reserve requirements on most of these deposits went up as people moved to the urban locations. So this, the geographical flight or, you know, uh, people accumulating cities was anti-inflationary, but time deposits, AKA savings account had a different reserve requirement for time deposits. Um, uh, Member banks only had to keep 3% for time deposits. And so even though people were moving to the cities, there was a massive shift towards time deposits in the 20s. And again, this is so people understand how the inflation was generated. This is reading from Pally. If I could, if I could just throw something yeah. in here real quick that's hopefully um, enabling for people that might be listening to this. Mm -hmm. To try and say it in somewhat plainer English. All of these deposits are liabilities of the bank, right? This is money that is owed to customers. And the percentages you just gave are the asset coverage that they're required to hold. Right? So they have, well, in the case of country banks, you went from 7.4% assets on the balance sheet. 7.4% assets per liability, right? to 2.5%. So they're, you're increasing the ratio of liabilities to assets going from 1913 to 1920. And this is why fractional reserve banking is inherently insolvent and fraudulent, right? There are these liabilities that cannot be covered by the assets of the bank's balance sheet. And the other point, I don't know if he goes into this or not, but so there's not only the move to the city driving deposits away from country into central reserve city, but when the, the failure comes, right, a lot of these country banks get consolidated. And so the, the, the fractional reserve bank, not only is it insolvent and fraudulent, but it also has this centralized centralization driving mechanism in it. That when these uh, higher 
these these country banks that have lower asset coverage ratios, they tend to get gobbled up by the bigger banks. So over time, we get you know less more of a centralization in the banking industry. I mean, that's what that's that is what's happening right now. I mean, we're we're what what one thing we're building to is there's a there's a huge section. Once we get through these two myths on what is the same between this period in the 1920s and what's different. And I and I had not added that element to it, which is that we're in the process of consolidating the banking system again. That is another the section on similarities and differences is long. So if I I'm not going to go write it down now because we're talking, but that is another similarity that we're in a period where all of the banking is being consolidated into a few large banks. Wow. Okay. And yes, and 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 please continue to do what you're doing, Robert, which is help explain why this is significant. And I guess what one thing I, I haven't said, which should be self-evident, is that as you lower the reserve requirements, you allow banks to just create new money. Every every lowering of reserve requirements allows bank to create money against the little deposits they have or large deposits, whatever. However, however, deposit, however many deposits they have, they can create a new multiple on top of that when reserve requirements are lowered. And so that Inject, is in, injecting more leverage into the system. Yeah. And yeah, I the the reason I made that interjection is because again, we're speaking in fed language so to speak, but to try and decrypt it. Yes. You know, it's it's purposely obfuscated language, so to try and decrypt it for the audience. I think it's easier to think about it in that way, right? Just you have a if you had a business that only that had liabilities there were 25x its assets. You'd be like, oh, well, that would probably be a pretty low valuation business, if not bankrupt. Yet in the banking system, that's the norm. The growth in time deposits was not accidental. Before the establishment of the Federal Reserve System, national banks were not legally permitted to pay interest on time deposits. So this category was confined to the less important state banks and savings banks. The Federal Reserve Act permitted national banks to pay interest on time deposits. Moreover, before the establishment of the Federal Reserve System, banks had been required to keep the same minimum reserves against time as against demand deposits. While the Federal Reserve Act cut the required reserve ratio roughly in half, it reduced required reserves against time deposits to 5% and in 1917 to 3%. This was surely an open invitation to the banks to do their best to shift deposits from the demand to the time category. During the 1920s, time deposits increased most in precisely those areas where they were the most active and the least likely to be misconstrued as idle savings. The least active time accounts are in savings banks. The most active are in large city commercial banks. Bearing this in mind, below are the increases over the period in the various categories. So savings banks, time deposits increased by 61.8%. So those were like the least active. Commercial banks, 79.8%. Country banks, 78% increase. They all increased. Reserve city banks, 128%. Central reserve city banks, 450% increase in time deposits. Oh, this was a Rothbard quote. Everything I read to you was Rothbard, not Pally. So central reserve city banks, where everyone is moving, they funneled everyone into these time deposits by paying interest. The amount of money there went up by 450% and the reserve requirements went down. That is, and that, but the bank can still issue liabilities against those all the same. It's the same liabilities they're issuing as versus demand deposits. Yeah. And here we've got yield being offered as an incentive to customers to shift deposits into these central reserve city banks, right? Yeah. This is the original yield farming. (laughs) Exactly. That's exactly where I was going with this. It's like, not only is that, that's that's giving the Fed more control, right? There's less throats to choke, right? More, fewer points of of control. And you can deputize some of these large banks as, well, they probably already are as central reserve banks. But the lesson I think for people in Bitcoin or crypto space is like, don't trust exchanges with Bitcoin that are offering you yield. Right. It's just it's a scam. Right. It's always been a scam. Banks have been doing this forever. Don't fall for it. There's a reason they're trying to bring you in with it. It's not like 
to help you. Exactly. To steal from you. One of my highest health priorities is keeping my brain in top shape. To take care of my brain power, I do many things such as striving to read, write, exercise, and meditate daily. One of the latest tools in my brain power toolkit is MindLab Pro. MindLab Pro is a nootropic supplement that is scientifically proven to enhance your brain power. When I take MindLab Pro, my mind feels like it has a better grip on the world, my thinking is more lucid, and the articulation of my speech is much more clear. MindLab Pro has been tested in rigorous, double-blind, placebo-controlled human trials and has been proven to enhance brain power for users in every age group. MindLab Pro is an advanced formulation of 11 nootropic ingredients and is backed by research from 1,473 human trials conducted over a period of 32 years. So if you're looking to start enhancing your brain power, MindLab Pro is an excellent solution. Go to mindlabpro.com slash breedlove to start enhancing your brain power today. Again, that's mindlabpro.com slash breedlove. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, CrowdHealth. CrowdHealth is a Bitcoin-enabled alternative to legacy health insurance. Now let's face it. Legacy health insurance is an absolute scam. Nobody can explain this better than the legendary comedian, Chris Rock. Insurance. You got to have some insurance. You got to. There's an insurance. They shouldn't even call it insurance. They should just call it in case shit. And I give a company some money in case shit happens. Now, if shit don't happen, shouldn't I get my money back? So with CrowdHealth, instead of just paying premiums that you'll never see again, you can hold part of this pool of savings in dollars and in Bitcoin through CrowdHealth. And when you have a health event, you can draw against this pool of communal savings. So go to joincrowdhealth.com slash breedlove to learn more or sign up. So now we're talking about reserve requirements shifting to be inflationary by shifting from demand deposits to time deposits, and that this was orchestrated by the Fed. But in addition to reserve requirements that banks can issue loans against, there's another factor that can create inflation, which is, you know, an increase in total reserves, the total number of reserves outstanding, not just how they're proportioned. Because even if, you know, reserve requirements didn't change, and if, if, if reserve requirements stayed static, an increase in the total amount of reserves would also allow banks to expand their credit. Um, and to this point, the shift in reserve type, it did account for 18.5% of the total inflation, but only 18.5%. So the remaining, the remaining 81.5, I've got two numbers that do not add up to 100. <laughs> Do I? Oh, yeah, I do. Okay, sorry. Uh, The remaining 81.5% of the monetary inflation was due to an increase in the total amount of reserves. So this this is going to get even more in detail. And, and I'm so impressed with, with the analysis that Rothbard did. It's so exhaustive and... It also should clue you in on how creative and complex and opaque the system has become, but how they are still able, the central bank is still able to generate inflation with, with even though there are countervailing forces that might, you might have a graph or an asset or a type of account, or, you know, the H8 data or the TBAC report or whatever someone's pointing to that's saying, oh, look, it's deflationary. The government still has ways to create the inflation. And so um, we're going deeper into how they created the inflation. Rothbard identified 10 factors in the reserve system that either increase or decrease total bank reserves. So of those 10 factors, um, he broke them down into whether or not they're factors that were controlled by the Federal Reserve or Treasury, or whether they're factors that are not controlled. Whether the so it's whether does the market control this factor, or does do the authorities control this factor? So I'm going to list all ten things that infl- influence total amount of reserves. Monetary gold stock, not controlled by the government. 
Federal Reserve asset purchased, assets purchased, that is controlled. Bills discounted by the Federal Reserve. If that number is an expansion, they are in control, meaning the bills, meaning the, the Fed is is purchasing bills and discounting them. So if that if they're purchasing more, they're in control. But if it's in contraction, meaning people are not offering them for sale, that's actually not controlled by the Fed. Uh, other, the, there's a category called other Federal Reserve credit, uh, wholly controlled by the Fed, but it's a negligible amount, but definitely controlled. Money in circulation outside of banks. Um, this is this just refers to the total currency in the hands of the public, and that is not controlled by the authorities. That's they choose if they want to redeem for dollars, have physical cash, that's up to the individual. Treasury currency outstanding. Now, treasury currency is um it's currency that is controlled by the US Treasury uh or by Fed or by statute. And that was mostly silver certificates. And those were backed 100% by silver bullion or silver dollars. Um, that was totally, that's again, totally controlled by the government. Uh, Treasury cash holdings. Uh, think of this as the, the um, Treasury general account. Um, but, it's, but, but it actually at the time meant literally cash bills that the Treasury had. Uh, which is also reserved. That is the which is also counter reserves. That's controlled. Um, Non-member bank deposits at the Federal Reserve. So this is um, entities, foreign entities, non-banks who have an account at the Federal Reserve uh, that is not controlled by the system. Um, that is, it, they are reserves, but the Fed does not control how much non-banks deposit with them. And then the last one is unexpended capital reserves, another negligible item. It's money, which has been earmarked for physically running the Fed, the buildings, the salary, paying electricity bill. It's not a controlled amount. It's also small. So those are the 10 factors of increase or decrease in total reserves. And all of them at different times from uh, 21 to 29, they both went up and down and all of them contributed to the, the, the expansion and contraction of total reserves. So Rothbart breaks the 21 to 29 period into 12 sub periods of expansion and contraction in total reserves. And he lists all of those factors, but the ones that contribute most to the increase or decrease in reserves. So in those 12 sub periods from 21 to 29, the uncontrolled factors, the ones that the US, that the Fed and Treasury didn't control, they declined seven times and increased five. The controlled factors rose in eight periods, but declined in four. And I know it's like, none of this gives you a really, you know, it's not like I'm saying uncontrolled factors always decreased and controlled factors always increased. It's not that clean. And that's part of what I think is the important takeaway. It's very messy. It's very convoluted. But as I go through and tell the, the recap Rothbard's summary of each subperiod, you will see that even though it's hard to tease out, ultimately, the factors that the government did control always overpowered the ones that they didn't control. And on balance, the ones that they didn't control were deflationary, and the ones they did were inflationary. And again, because I want Bitcoiners to be able to go back to this as a reference like a really detailed reference and like uh, for how a government can control an inflation, even if there's data out there saying that they're not. So here's what Rothbard says about this approach. He says, any division into historical periods is to a degree arbitrary, yet they were chosen because the author believes they accord the best with the most significant sub periods of the 1920s. The following are the unique characteristics of the sub periods. So, 21 to July, June 21 to July 22. Uh, bills discounted, uh, which had been falling since 1920, continued to fall from 1.75 billion in June to a bottom of, of ha less than half a billion, 0.4 billion in August of 22. Total reserve credit also bottomed in July of 1922, as did money in circulation. So this is, they're coming off the, the deflation, the depression of 1921. 
July was therefore chosen as the terminal month. A superficial glance would lead one to believe that the main inflationary factor was the heavy inflow of gold and that the Federal Reserve simply did not offset this influx of gold sufficiently. A deeper analysis, however, shows that the banks paid off their loans at such a rapid rate that uncontrolled factors of inflation fell by 303 million. If the government had remained completely passive, therefore, member banks reserve member bank reserves would have declined by 303 million. Instead, they increased the purchase of U.S. government securities by 278 million. They increased treasury currency by 150 million and increased bills bought by 100 million. All in, the government actively pumped 462 million of new reserves, yielding a net increase of 157 million. It's period one. Period two, July 1922 to December 1922. So it's half the, half, the back half of 1922. Total reserve credit climbed upward sharply, hitting a peak in December, as did total reserves. Bills discounted reached a peak in November. This period saw a rapid acceleration of the inflation of reserves, increasing at an average rate of 12 million per month in period one. Reserve now, reserves now increased at a rate of 35 million per month. Once again, Uncontrolled factors declined by 295 million, but they were more than offset by an increase in controlled reserves pumped into the economy. These consisted of bills discounted, 212 million, bills bought, 132 million, and treasury currency, 93 million. Periods three and four. This would cover December 1922 to June 24. This saw the inflation come briefly to a halt. Remember, nothing goes in a straight line. Reserves actually fell slightly, just by four million per month in period three, and rose only slightly six million per month, six million per month in period four. At the same time, bank deposits remained about level. Bank demand deposits stayed at about thirteen point five billion total deposits. This is, by the way, is analogous to the period we're in right now. In fact, now we see money declining, but again, this is mid inflation, and I think, in the broader sense, we're in the middle of a massive period of inflation that will follow this. So this is, I think this 22 to 24 period is analogous to 1923 into 24. Uh, going back to Rothbard, total deposits and total money supply, however, rose more in this period with banks shifting to time deposits to permit increases. Demand deposits rose by 450 million from June 23 to June 24, but time deposits rose by 1.5 billion. Total money supply rose by 3 billion. The economy responded to the slowdown of inflation by entering upon a mild minor recession, just like now, from May of 23 to July of 24. Interesting, 23 to 24 parallel. Uncontrolled factors this time fell by 149 million, but they were more than offset by a controlled increase of 198 million, led by the heavy purchase of government securities, 339 million, the heaviest average monthly buying spree seen yet in the 1920s. Period five, June 1924 to November 1924. This was the most rapid reserve inflation to date, overreaching the previous peak of late 1922. Reserves increased by 39.8 million per month. Once again, the inflation was deliberate, where uncontrolled factors declined by 262 million but they were offset by deliberate increase of 461 million. The critical factors of inflation were bills bought, 277 million, and the purchase of US securities, 153 million. The pace of inflation was greatly slowed in the next three periods, but it did continue. So here's a side note about this period. Again, we're talking about June 24, November 24. We talked about Britain going back on gold just at, they were preparing to go back on gold during this period. And they had slightly overvalued their currency when they went back on gold at 486. We did an episode about this. And this was 10 to 20% higher than what its current going exchange rate. So again, to recap, if they went back to gold at 4.86, then Britain would have to lower prices. Well, if they went, if they wanted to go back to gold at 46, they'd have to lower prices by 20% to stay competitive. If they were overvaluing their currency, they'd have to lower prices so that they could still be competitive in the export market. But we know from history that prices didn't decline because labor forces wouldn't permit wages to decline. Uh, 
and the country couldn't raise rates in order to contract credit and cause prices to go down. Because then if they raised rates, unemployment would go up and wages would go down. So gold continued to leave Great Britain at the exact moment they were trying to go back on the gold standard. So and this gets back to like the ego and these relationships. Montague Norman and Benjamin Strong, Montague Norman, they got together and Montague Norman, the governor of the Central Bank of England, he got Benjamin Strong, Central Bank president of the United States, to create inflation here in the US in that very year. Because the thinking was, since all, all fiat currencies, floating fiat currencies are relative, if the pound couldn't organically appreciate 10 to 20%, well, the Americans could get the dollar to depreciate 10 to 20%, and then England could go back at 486. This is not like some conspiracy theory. This is what they did. They talked about it. They made a formal arrangement to do this. And they were deals that were made because, you know, these two guys, they liked each other, and they had a, a personal interest in seeing the system return to the way it had been. So, I mean, look, it's a system I like. And you know, we've done this whole podcast as a tribute to the gold standard. And yet here we see that the American financial officials were sacrificing the purchasing power of an entire nation because there was no political will of another nation to make the same sacrifice. And because causing inflation would make unwitting U.S. citizens happy because their stocks would go up and they were getting new cars. So um, in mid-1922, the pound went down from 46 to four 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 dollars and 44 dollars per pound in 22 but my mid 24 it was in even worse shape at 434 so at that point and i'm reading from i think this is pally I've, I've got a bunch of quotes and sometimes i don't know who it is uh at that point matters took a decisive turn american prices began to rise due to the american inflation in the foreign exchange markets, a return to gold at the old parity was anticipated. The sterling dollar exchange rate appreciated from 434 to 478. In the spring of 25, therefore, it was thought that the adjustment between sterling and gold prices was sufficiently close to warrant a resumption of gold payments at the old parity. Uh, Benjamin Strong writes a letter to then Treasury Secretary Andrew Mellon in the spring of 24, explaining that we need to raise American price levels relative to Great Britain's and, and lower American interest rates so that Great Britain can return to gold. Strong writes to Andrew Mellon, the burden of this readjustment must fall more largely upon us than upon them, meaning Great Britain. It will be difficult politically and socially. Oops, where's my... Uh, it will be difficult for us politically and socially for the British government and the Bank of England to face a price liquidation in England in the face of the fact that their trade is poor and they have over a million unemployed people receiving government aid. That's strong writing to Mellon saying that we need to do this. So the US did see a little bit of gold leave from 24 to 25, even though it was an inflationary period. For England, 25 into 26 as they went back it saw their first reversal in the flight of gold as gold began very briefly to go back to the uk as they went back on on gold so i guess like you could say it i mean in the end like for their purposes it worked briefly but again i mean i don't know how to square this with the opening passages i i think they really thought it would work i don't think this is a case where they were like deceiving themselves but it is a small measure of the escalation of the problem. And again, you know, going back to the quagmire model, they were at the very beginning. If, if you want to like map this onto Vietnam, this is like, this is still when the French controlled Vietnam. The Americans aren't really, this is so early. So they're doing their first little bits of tinkering thinking, hey, what's the big deal? It hasn't, it hasn't, it hasn't like gone to full escalation where we're sending hundreds of thousands of troops in yet. Um, period. Six, now we're November 24 to 25, uncontrolled reserves decreased, but were offset by an increase in controlled reserves that came from bills that discounted bills bought, 446 million and 45 million respectively. Period seven, October uh, 25, November 25 to October 26. So pretty much a full year. 
the first time after period three that uncontrolled factors actually increased reserves. And in this time, the Fed just set back and they did nothing to offset. This, of all the periods, the first time that uncontrolled factors increased reserves, the Fed did nothing. But this time, uh, yeah, I wrote the same sentence twice. The Federal Reserve failed to offset factors sufficiently, although the degree of inflation was very slight. Period eight, October 1926 to July 27. So fall of 26 and the summer of 27. Uh, inflation was still small, but ominously, the Federal Reserve stoked the fires of inflation rather than checked them. Controlled factors increased, as did uncontrolled. The culprits this time were U.S. government securities bought, uh, 91 million, and other credit, 30 million. Period nine. Now we're to July 27 to December 1927. It's a short period, half the year. Another period of accelerated and heavy inflation, surpassing the previous peaks of 22 and 24. The per month reserve increase in the end of 2027 was 42 million per month. And again, uncontrolled factors declined, but they were offset by a very large increase in controlled reserves emanating from bills bought, 220 million, US government securities, 225 million, and bills discounted, 140 million. By the way, in 27, Pal, you talks about this, $18 billion of new corporate bonds were offered as opposed to 700 million in new issues of common stock. There was a preference in the period for issuing corporate debt over stock so that stock valuations wouldn't suffer. And I think it's not something I've, I'd heard before, but people say it was a stock market bubble in the 20s, but the corporate bond bubble was way bigger. Um, stock market valuations then served as collateral and fueled more debt. And the point is that companies weren't financing themselves on new stock. They were financing themselves on new bit new debt. So this is all like this is Austrian business cycle theory come to life in this period. Period 10. December 1927 to July 1928. We're getting close to the crash. This was the sharpest deflationary period in reserves in the whole of the 1920s. Uncontrolled factors rose, but they were more than offset by a controlled decrease. So now that the inflation was now getting out of control, finally the Fed decided, oh, we got to act. We got to halt the inflation. The deflation of reserves in the first half of 1928 wasn't sufficient to offset the shift to time deposits and the other factors increased the money supply. The Fed thought their job was done, however, and they resumed their own inflation. You know, they, they thought we did it and they started inflation again in, in, in the end of 28. Period 11 from July of 28 to, 20, to December 28, the tendency of uncontrolled reserves to decrease was offset by a positive and deliberate increase, 364 million of controlled reserves against 100, minus 122 million of uncontrolled. Uh, the culprit here was bills bought, which increased by 327 million. And in the last period, period 12, December 1928 to June of 1929, the tide finally turned where uncontrolled factors increased by 390 million, but they were offset by a decrease in 423 million in controlled reserve, consisting almost wholly of a reduction of 407 million in bills bought. Total reserves fell by a modest 33 million. So far, we've seen no reason why this deflation should have had any greater effect than the deflation of period 10. The crucial difference, however, is this. In period 10, time deposits rose by 1.1 billion, but in period 12, time deposits far from rising fell by 70 million total money supply rose only from 73 billion at the end of 28 to 73.26 billion by 29 basically stood still for the first time since 1921 june 1921 the money supply remained constant and had stopped increasing the great boom of the 1920s was now over and the great depression had begun the country however didn't really discover the change until the stock market finally crashed in October. Looking back, the great American stabilization of 1922 to 1929 was really a vast attempt to destabilize the value of money in terms of human effort by means of a colossal program of investment 
which succeeded for a surprisingly long period, but which no human ingenuity could have managed to direct indefinitely on sound and balanced lines. Such an excellent and exhaustive <laughs> coverage of exactly what led to the Great Depression, right? The the if I go back to the beginning, right, where you have information, the information's not maybe too in your interest, let's say, and so you sh you know the the people inside these institutions shift into the cover your ass self preservation mode. I can't help but wonder, you know, if the, the inception of the Federal Reserve, what I just wonder what was going on inside of those walls, right? Were they were they actually trying to engineer the economy to be stabilized, or was this just um, a, a narrative being sold to justify more control, more regulation? And then, because ultimately, you know, as the crash comes, it gets blamed on laissez-faire capitalism rather than all of these interventions which rothbard is so clearly and exhaustively outlined yeah i just hope i i i really want this you know this this book and and so this episode by proxy should be the ultimate argument settler for people if if they had any doubt in their minds as to what caused it and in terms of what was going on i mean i just don't know you know we just don't know i don't i don't know i i I don't know if it's a case of they thought they were doing a good thing and they were misguided or most likely they just had their own I don't know man I I met us I met a highly cynical point at this moment in time and I don't <laughs> want to necessarily apply that to every everything in history but you know I'm 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 feeling jaded at the moment so you could almost dispense with the intentionality though and just say the central planning has bad outcomes, right? It, almost unavoidably so. Mm -hmm. And as you know, I always go back to Hayek on this, where we often talk about like central planning versus free market, but it's really centralized planning versus decentralized planning. So when you have centralized planning, that means there are plans and preferences established by a small group of people that are imposed on everyone else. Whereas a free market is people are self-sorting, right? Individuals have their own plans and preferences that they express in the market through buying and selling. And so if we talk about good and bad outcomes, it's like, well, do we care about the market economy being mapped onto the, the plans and preferences of individuals? Or do we care about it being mapped onto the plans and preferences of a few people that right. impose it on everyone else? And so it's almost like by definition, bad. It's just never... If if the greater greater good, I hate to use that term because it's abused by socialists, but if the greater good or human flourishing is your actual metric, then central planning doesn't work. Period. No, it only really leads to the flourishing of the people doing the planning. Those are the only people who really flourish in the long run. And I won't yeah. say that they didn't. It's it's very complicated. There are times where I think that the central bank did the only thing they could do. And I don't know that I would do it differently. I always go back to the the creation of the, the FHA where they bought out people's mortgages, you know, in the when when banks were failing and people's more people couldn't pay their mortgages and they extended the duration of those mortgages and allowed, you know, a million people to stay in their homes. I would call that a good in the short term. And and could they know that that would lead to the 20 and 30 year mortgage market, which would lead to the securitization of mortgages, which would lead to the housing bubble, which would lead to the government having to put all of that private debt on their balance sheet, which would lead to what, where we are today? You know, I mean, I don't know. I, I guess I, I, I've always come back to the same thing, which is whether you ascribe intentionality to it, good motives, bad motives. I just see this as just inevitable either way. Everything that's happening is just inevitable. Yeah, and even if that was good in the short run, it's just like the lie we mentioned earlier, right? The got the lie is good in the short run, right? It it prevents the the insolvency from being exposed or or whatever the lie is from coming to light. <laughs> but it comes at the cost of long 
run more damage in the long run. So, like, I mean, what's the difference between Carolyn Ellison's admi- admission on the stand and Strong's letter to Andrew Mellon? Well, it's not going to be good. We won't we won't really work, but we could spend customer funds by by inflating the American money supply yeah. and then it'll work. If we just do if we just do this thing, which we have at our disposal, then it'll work. It, they're yeah. literally the same motivation. Yeah, a little bit of theft to fix the problem. Yeah. Um, which there's another I think this is Rothbard actually a quote. He says, Gradualism in theory is perpetuity in practice. So once you start uh, just a little bit of theft. Mm-hmm. Well, you're sowing the seeds for the next crisis per Austrian business cycle theory. Next crisis comes, uh, a little bit more theft. And so the cycle continues. And well, what's the answer? Giving people uh, an opt-out, right? Opt-out of the, the scheme uh, into an incorruptible monetary system. I wonder Bitcoin- how different this would have been with Bitcoin. I think it was what was missing because we did have gold then, but I think what was missing was the perspective of where this goes because Pally's whole book, if you haven't listened to the early chapters, Pally's whole book focuses on the psychological shift of the 20s. Um, up until 1914, people had believed in convertibility and believed in the power mm-hmm. of gold. And for the first time in human history, once World War I was over, people were faced with the idea that, well, maybe it's not necessary. So I will say that, you know, humans had the benefit of ignorance at this period of time and not knowing where this was going and feeling like, oh, maybe the shackles of the gold standard. Uh, Boy, if we can fund a, a war, a huge industrial war, a global war with government debt, Maybe we can use that as a force for good. And that's, I think, a lot of what how Pally explains the shift of the 20s away from the desire for convertibility. And I think it's taken us 100 years to realize, yeah, that that's a perfect quote that, what is it, incrementalism? Gradualism in theory is perpetuity in practice. Yeah. And I think they were just the very beginnings of gradualism then. Mm-hmm. So... You know, I I don't know. I don't know if Bitcoin would have made a difference then because they didn't really see the value. Yeah, maybe you're right. I don't know. I mean, I guess we have to learn through the pain. Although I would argue, I mean, maybe at this point people didn't know. Obviously, this thing is very complicated. Even looking back at it 100 years hence, it's hard to understand. So people probably, it's probably huge information asymmetry. Um. But there were less, I mean, we knew about central banking, right? That was part of the American revolution was to get out from under the Bank of England. Founding fathers knew central banking was a problem. But it's, that's not to say that that information was widely dispersed. So maybe we need we need these painful lessons to further reinforce the importance of something like Bitcoin to prevent or at least mitigate things like this happening in the future. And I think the purpose of us talking about it now is to so that people can have the conviction to stay with Bitcoin through this very complicated period where there's going to be moments where you think you're wrong mm-hmm. and moments where you think that the powers that be have it right and under control and that you're crazy. I think that's a great place to put a button on it. Okay. Luster. Thank you again. Thank you, sir. Your work is thorough and impressive. Thanks, man. Until next time. Okay, I'll talk to you soon.